from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. In 2008, um, you know, of course, that Jeff Smith is best known as writer and artist of Bone. It's an award-winning adventure about his three cartoon cousins lost in a world of myth and ancient mysteries. In 2008, Smith was the subject of a documentary called The Cartoonist, Jeff Smith, Bone, and the Changing Face of Comics. And besides Bone, Jeff has also written some other books, including Shazam, The Monster Society of Evil, and Little Mouse Gets Ready. So everybody get ready. To put your hands together for Jeff Smith. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out today in this unbelievable heat. Um, let's see. Now, how do I write on this? Is there like a pen or... No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is probably going to be pretty hard for everybody to see, but we'll do our best. I thought I would just uh, draw just a few qu quick pictures, make a short presentation, uh, and then get right to uh, questions, because uh, I like to talk to kids anyway. So. Um, you know, when, when I go to book events like this, um, I th it's new, it's a new experience for me to um, be considered a book writer. Because when I started read, you know, started drawing comics, and, and definitely when I started reading them, comics were, they were not considered really reading. I, I, I think that um, it might have even gone the other way, and people thought that comics caused illiteracy. <laughs> and I'm not making that up. Uh, I, even as a kid, even when I was seven years old, I knew that comics was reading. Uh, you, you read it just like a book, you know, you, you go left to right, top to bottom, just like a regular book. But there's certain kinds of symbols and pieces of language that are unique to comics. Um, and surprisingly, we all know them. You know, like sweat flying out of the head means you're, you know, you're nervous or worried. Uh, a, little, a little cloud coming off the back of your feet means you're running. Uh, these kind of symbols, they're, they're unique to comics, um, but they, they work together with the words in the balloons and the images are all, all part of uh, the storytelling together. So um, I want to just start by talking about what it was that made me want to go into comics and into cartooning instead of doing something normal. But I think when I was looking at comics as a kid, maybe I can pull this closer. I gotta figure out how I'm gonna do this. I guess I'll say it and then go draw it. Uh, it one of the things that interested me in, in like Snoopy or Donald Duck or Bugs Bunny was that you could see where the characters were looking. You could see their eyes. And, or, or just with the eyebrows or whatever, you could tell what they were thinking. So uh, I'll draw phone bone, uh, and then maybe I'll come back and talk about it. So this is Phone Bone, uh, and he's, uh, if you're familiar with the Bone characters, which probably most of you are, he's the friendly one. He's the, the, more, the more curious cousin. He's, he's the one probably that we all most want to be like or think we are like. But what's interesting, uh, or what I'm, I don't know if it's interesting, but what I want to try to convey is his, see his body position. He's talking here to Ted the Bug. And he's leaning forward, and he's smiling, and his, his, you know, his eyebrows are kind of up in the air. His, his, his one hand is back. It's all very unthreatening. He's interested in what Ted has to say. This is part of the language of comics. And also, 
I, you probably didn't notice me do it, but when I drew Ted the bug, I actually kind of traced a little line, an invisible line from his eyes, so I could tell where he was looking. So now I'll draw a different character. You can't have enough err. <laughs> How did you sign that, by the way? <laughs> so, so now here, now here, this is uh, Phone Bone's cousin, Phony Bone, and he's a, a much, well, as you can see, he's a much crankier, angrier character. And again, I use his body position. He's kind of hunched over. You can see his fists are all balled up. He's got his, he's baring his teeth. His, his eyebrows are frowning. And of course, he has all sorts of like lightning bolts and, and you know, f <laughs> plumes of, of clouds coming off his head. Uh, and of course, the, the, the famous word balloon where we know what he's saying. This is the third bone cousin, Smiley Bone, so-called because he smiles. Uh, and Smiley Bone, uh, he's, a, he's a more whimsical character, uh, and I've portrayed this by having him play an instrument. Uh, his eyes are closed, his dog's hanging out of his mouth look like a, uh, his tongue's hanging out of his mouth like a dog. Sorry, this, this is nervous looking out here and seeing, it makes me nervous seeing all you people out here. Um, so that's, so that's the three bone characters, the three main cousins. And then I would just like to try to do a quick demonstration here of how you, how I as a cartoonist write, how do you write with, at, in cartoons? And the basic, the smallest like element or piece of writing in comics are, are, are unit. Sorry, I, let, me, let me just say that again. The smallest unit of writing in comics is any two given panels. So if you draw one panel um, where Smiley Bone is standing there,
when someone's running, it always helps to put a little shadow underneath them. And the little cloud of dust. So in this panel, oh, let's add one more thing. A banana peel. All right. So um, of course we probably know it's going to happen, but it's crucial to like see it. All right, there's an import, a couple important elements that I need to add in. Uh, the swoosh line of his foot. Uh, oh, I need to put the banana peel. Uh, and there we go. And with these two uh, panels, we now have an action. Uh, the reader, whether he's you know a nine-year-old kid or a 50-year-old man like me, that you make the action happen. It's two totally separate pieces of art, and yet when you put the two together, it's that jump from one panel to the next where you turn it into movement. I think we need a third panel, though. All right, well, you, so you get the idea. You, it's, it's, it's leaping. This, this little space between the panels actually has a name. It's called the gutter. And it's actually jumping over the gutter that is the actual magic or the, or the act of reading that really takes place when you're doing a comic. All right. That, that's it, really. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> So what we'd like to do now is uh, if there's any kids or anybody who wants to ask a question or anything, we have some microphones. If you could line up behind the microphones, we'll talk. All right, so uh, why don't we start over here? What's your name? Is, that, is, there, is there a sound person? Sound guy. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> why don't we start over here? Okay. You got it now? All right. My name is Colette, and Hi, Colette. what gave you your idea of just the whole setting of, like, the, um, like, how was Bone Bone so grumpy, and, like, how did you make up the whole dragons and right. all that? Yeah, I, I, okay, um, how do I explain that? Uh, <laughs> what gave you the idea, sort of? What, yeah, when, when I was, like, five, I really wanted to make up my own cartoon character. Because uh, back then, Peanuts were in the newspaper, and I, uh, every Sunday night, the Walt Disney used to be on TV. He was still alive then. And he would introduce his character. So I knew that Walt Disney made up Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. I knew that uh, Charles Schultz made up Peanuts. So I thought, well, I want to make up a cartoon character. So I just kept trying. I made up all sorts of them. I made up dogs and worms and birds and superheroes and things. 
Um, but this little guy kind of looked kind of like a bone, you know, with the, the way his, he's got his round head and his big nose, he looks like a dog bone. He just kind of stuck with me. And I think the reason he stuck with me is because of what I was talking about a little bit here is like I could, I could see his different emotions. I, I actually thought it was fun to solve the puzzle of what would it look like if you turn his head around in, in, in space and like saw him from the back or if he was angry or if he was tired. What were all these, how would he look? How would I draw it really? So I had a lot of fun with that. So I drew those kind of classic American big nose, three fingered characters all my life. And then when I was in college, there was a magazine called Heavy Metal, which we all know now, and it's it's kind of a kind of a cheesecakey magazine. But back when it, when it first came out, it was very different. It was a bunch of European cartoonists who did a, a fantasy, like science fiction and fantasy for grown-ups. It was and it was really genius, really well done. And I thought, you know what? If you could take Bugs Bunny, Mickey Mouse characters and put them in like this heavy metal fantasy world or, or, or put Bugs Bunny into a real book like Moby Dick or Le Mort d'Arthur. Don't worry. <laughs> it, it, I thought it would be fun, so that's what I did. It's, by the way, I see you're holding the uh, Bone One Volume Edition there. Are your arms getting tired? Yeah, I just love how, so can, I ask, can I ask how old you are? I'm 10. 10, and you've read that whole thing? Oh, you're almost, still holding it. I'm almost, I, uh, I've almost read the um, half of the Bone series. I um, actually didn't hear of them until last year when my friend pointed them out to me, and I got them from my school library. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Colette. And um, do you think I can get one of those pictures you drew? Yeah, you can, coach, you can talk to someone over here. I'm going to stay out of that. <laughs> yes? Um, okay. I... I When you made up the Bones character, did it just sort of like flow with, uh, from your pencil? Do you think of these characters before you draw them, or do you just write something down and see? I think I it? understand that. Did you get? Can everybody hear all the questions and everything? All right. Her question was, when she saw me drawing the characters, you know, and it just looked like I was, you know, moving around in different parts and drawing them. I think you were asking, do I see it before I draw it? Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's actually a really good question, and I. I try my best, I, I try to do that. I try to like, before I start, I, I kind of already know where everything's gonna be. Uh, I try to picture the drawing and then just kind of trace my imagination as I'm seeing it. I have certain little tricks, which I'll try to show you one. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Let's say, uh, let's say foam bone was gonna throw a baseball. Well, that would be kind of a hard thing to do. So what I would probably do is I'll picture in my head, okay, he's probably, what's up? I don't know. So, is that right? I don't know. I'm not, a, I don't play baseball. Okay. All right, but this is the trick I was going to tell you about. Because it's, it's kind of unnatural for a little cartoon character to like, he doesn't really have bones, not real ones. So what I would draw after I got his position down of his head where he's got his determined throwing face, now I'm going to draw, draw his hand and I'm going to put it where it would be interesting. Okay. So so now I'm, I'm not really going to worry about how long his arm is or anything. I'm just going to connect it up to his body. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, what inspired you to make like the evil character Briar sisters with Grandma Ben, like the good character? There are um, twins. Hap there's a twins happen a lot in storytelling. 
stories that go way back, all the way to you know, Roman times, uh, and and older than that. Uh, it's a very popular kind of um, motif to tell stories because, and it, it's all throughout bone. You'll see you have foam bone and phony bone. You have the good one and the bad one. Um, so basically, it's just kind of like a, like a, a running joke, so to speak, throughout all of bone. So you have not only foam bone and phony bone, you have grandma, rose, you have rose, and you have briar. So there's just, a lot of times there's two. It's just, a, it's just kind of a story kind of trick. Okay. Thanks, man. Oh, wait. Yes. Uh, yes, I'd first just like to say I'm a really big fan of your work. And, Thanks, um, man. Second, uh, I was researching you on the internet one day, and I read somewhere that you at one point challenged fellow cartoonist Dave Sim to a boxing match. Do you mind telling the story behind that? <laughs> That's a great story. Um, <laughs> except that it was the other way around. He challenged me to oh, a match. Oh, okay. But he also, he didn't want to do any of the work. He wanted me to, like, <laughs> set up the boxing ring. and It was silly. Uh, we had a f we, we got, f got in a fight. We were mad at each other. And, um, I don't know. It was silly. That, I don't want to. I don't want to tell that story. That's a All bad right. story. <laughs> <laughs> you can find out about it on the internet if you really want All to. Right. All right. <laughs> Thanks, man. Go ahead. What is the story of the red dragon? The story of the red dragon. Now, how do I tell that story to kids? Um, the story of the red dragon is. Uh, it, in stories, you need to have uh, a mentor, a kind of a guardian angel type character. Uh, in Star Wars, that was Obi-Wan Kenobi. Well, in Bone, it's, uh, it's the great, great red dragon. He kind of watches, uh, watches over him. The idea of the character came from, uh, in around the world, dragons have different me meanings. In the East, like in China, uh, dragons are very good characters. They're, um, they represent uh, water and wind, and they're, they're protective guardians. They're good. They're good, like, good powers. Whereas in the West, in our culture, dragons are usually bad. They're fire-breathing. They, uh, they always want to hoard princesses and gold and things they really have no use for at all, but they're bad. So I thought maybe the very first dragon would be a, a very good benevolent dragon. And then her, that dragon, who is Queen Mim in the, in the Bone story, her son would be the red dragon. So he's sort of Western dragons, uh, breathes fire, and Eastern dragons, he's a guardian, and he has a goatee, sort of like Chinese dragons do. Uh, and then all other dragons, like the Eastern and Western dragons, all descended from him. So that was sort of like his mythology. All right? Thanks. Yes, sir. Um, so, when when you draw bone, do you think about how more um, the sword play and fighting the rat creatures and all the other guys? Uh, that's more of Grandma Ben and Thorn's department, but. Uh, but it's usually, uh, except for one part in uh, Crown of Thorns, <laughs> okay. um, the, it's never the Bone Brothers cousins. So wait, so let me see if I understand. You're, you're saying when I'm writing, am I, do I compartmentalize it? Or is, one, is the adventure part more important than the funny part? No, it's... Um, no. <laughs> Go ahead. So um, it's just they never really pick up a sword and do a lot of fighting. They, right. It's more Thorn style and Grandma Ben style. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think of the Bones as their cartoon characters. And they're, they're classic comedy uh, slapstick comedians like the Marx Brothers or uh, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. And their job isn't really to do the adventure stuff. You know, their job is, is to get in trouble basically <laughs> and uh and that's how it works out and sort of the luke skywalker part of the story that fell to thorn and grandma ben to do so uh i did i did think that that they should be separate 
Okay, sure. All right, we're getting down. We've got about two more minutes left, so let's try to ask a couple more questions quick. Um, well, do you have any advice to uh, fellow storytellers of how to balance, who want to write stories to balance like comedic, really silly, really funny, really fun stuff with mythology and epic? Well, uh, I, well I'm, I've always liked comedies that forget that they're comedies for a while. And I think one of the first movies that really struck me was a, An American Werewolf in London, which is a comedy, but it's also one of the most terrifying films I've ever seen. Ghostbusters did a really good job of balancing humor and big scale, you know, end of the world, cataclysmic stuff. So uh, m my best advice would be to find examples of it, you know, um, and just read it and do your best to deconstruct it and see how it works. Watch it a couple times, you know, whatever. That's, that's what I did. Does that help at all? Yeah, all right. thank you. All right. Are you, are you going to create any more books? Uh, I am going to create more books. I'm probably not going to make any more bone books, I'm sorry to say. Um, we are doing a, a series of, oh, hey. <laughs> we're going to do a series of books that are prose books that I'm going to do the illustrations for. Uh, but I didn't really want them to be sequels, and my one rule was I didn't want the three bone cousins to be in it because I, I don't really like, I don't like sequels. I, I really think once the story is over, it should be done, and you can kind of, you, it's up to you to imagine what happens to the characters and where they go after that. Yeah, um, all right, last question. Here we go. Out of all the books that you've written so far, how, which one is your favorite uh, bone cousin to write about? Like, who's your favorite to describe? Uh, you know, I, I go through, they're all my favorites sometimes. Phony Bone is so much fun because he's, he always says such nasty things that you could never really say in real life, and it's really fun to do that sometimes. But in all honesty, I mean, it has to be Phone Bone. He's probably the one I most closely identify with, and, uh, and he's, he's my guy, all right? Well, all right, well, thank you, everyone, for coming. They tell me my time's up. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.